All right, uh, Matthew chapter 19, and of course, may God bless the junior church, the boys and girls next door, and we're thankful uh, that uh, God has uh, blessed us with the uh, boys and girls still. And for these 62 years of Gateway Baptist Church, wow, uh, is it 62? Do the math. Uh, 1961, it's now tw- uh, 2023, 62, right? Yeah. Is that right, Cecil? <laughs> okay. Okay, I lean on you heavy, brother. I'm <laughs> okay. All right, good to see all of you here this beautiful Lord's Day, and uh, we're so thankful. Um, there it is, Matthew 19, verse 16. And uh, behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, which um, good, the very word, implies God. God is good. And everything that God does is good. We may not understand all that God is doing. We may not think or feel like it's good. But our good God, all that he does is good. And uh, it's an important word. And Jesus takes notice of this uh, man, calling him good. Jesus notices that. And he's going to speak to it momentarily. What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Do you know what's on this person's mind? Well, now we do. And it's on the mind these 2,000 years later of so many others. (laughs) Uh, Eternal life. And um, and his thinking is not so unlike the thinking of most people still today. Did you pick up on that? Did you catch that in verse 16? What good thing shall I do? So if you were to stop and meditate on this, This man that has come to Jesus about gaining eternal life, about getting, having eternal life, he is thinking that there's something he needs to do. Um, There's some good thing, let's be precise, there's some good thing that he needs to do in order to have eternal life. And now, um, we're going to look at, at, at what many think to be the most hated doctrine of the Bible, or the, the most despised teaching of the Holy Bible. Um, so let's look at it. Uh, and uh, let's, let's go to Romans chapter 3. And now mark your place. It'll help you. We're going to come back here. <clears throat> but the Bible is its own best commentary. So to understand the Bible, we'll use the Bible. Romans chapter 3 and verse number 12. So, you have a young man, and he is a young man, he, <clears throat> he's rich, but um, we're, we're given more detail as we progress into the passage. Uh, so, we, we, have a, <clears throat> we have a man asking Jesus, what good thing shall I do? Um, Romans 3.12 Look what God says about all of mankind. No exceptions, no exclusions about every person. Uh, They are all gone out of the way. 
they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth, doeth what? There's none that doeth good. No, not one. So we have a man coming to Jesus and asking Jesus, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And then we have God saying there's, um, there's none that doeth good. Wow. Let's look a little more in Psalm 14 and verse 2 and 3. Um, so here's a young here's a young man. What good thing shall I do? <clears throat> and here's God saying, uh, "There's none that doeth good. No, not one." <laughs> Look at this, if you would please, in um, Psalm chapter fourteen, and I'm going to read verse two and three of Psalm chapter fourteen. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. And so verse 3 tells us what God finds as he looks down from heaven. What does God, what does God find? He, he says, they are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. And watch this. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Wow. Um, it's what God sees. There's none that doeth good. So, Matthew 19, and uh, so the doctrine that is most despised is the doctrine of total depravity of man. The total depravity of man. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. What good thing shall I do? But there's none that doeth good. No, not one. So that's, that's problematic. <laughs> There's none that doeth good. Total depravity. That I may have eternal life. In verse 17 of Matthew 19, And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? Because packaged into the word good is God. And so, why callest thou me good? <clears throat> there is none good but one. And who is that? God. God. And uh, it's, it's as though the Lord Jesus is saying to this <clears throat> man, uh, do, do you realize I am God? In fact, Jesus is God. And, uh, but <clears throat> now, uh, he goes on to address the question in verse uh, <clears throat> 17, but if thou wilt enter into life, uh, and, and of course, eternal life, okay, uh, keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. Wow. And uh, so as the discussion, the conversation uh, proceeds. He saith unto him, which? And Jesus responds, Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not do what? Okay, you're with me. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. 
and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So we would, we would recognize that list of commandments as being part of what larger list? The Ten Commandments. Now watch the reply. This is such an amazing discussion. The young man is going to respond now to Jesus in verse 20, and please see it. The young man saith unto him, and would you look at this? All these things have I kept from my youth up. Where are you going to go with that? Where is God going to go with that reply, that response? To these commandments. Do you realize what the man is telling Jesus when he says, all these things have I kept? What is he saying? He's telling Jesus from his youth up, he has obeyed all of the commandments that Jesus just recited to him he says I've obeyed them that's what the word kept means now where is God going going to go with that response um, well let's uh Let's look and see where God goes. And to do that, let's go ahead to, um, let's go to uh, 1 John chapter 3. Let's do that. 1 John chapter 3. If you want to know where, what God says, then we're just going to go to his word. John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Whosoever Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law because those commandments that Jesus recited are from God's law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Okay? I think we understand that. What constitutes sin disobedience to God's law, disobeying the commandments of God. That's sin. Um, all right, we get that. Now, um, 1 John chapter 1, you're close, maybe a page back, 1 John chapter 1. I mean, here's a man who just looking Jesus in the eyes says, I have kept all of these commandments from my youth up to this present moment in time. And really, uh, we should understand, he's telling Jesus from the age of his accountability to God, from the, from the moment he became accountable to God, call that the age of accountability, up to the present moment of his life, I've kept every one of those commandments. That's what he's looking for. Jesus in the eyes and saying to him. But what does God say in his word? And uh, so let's look. 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 8. Uh, if we say we have no sin, and that is what he's saying. He's telling Jesus, I have, I, I've not, I've not broken those commandments. I've obeyed those commandments. I, I've not sinned. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. <laughs> now look at verse 9. Um, one of the, one of the uh, best known verses in all of the Bible. If we confess our sins, so if we admit it, he's not admitting it. <laughs> But if we admit, confess our sins, 
he is faithful and just to do what? To forgive us. To forgive us. Our sins. He just, God just wants us to admit it. God wants us to admit to him what God already knows. And what does God already know? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What else does God know? There's none righteous. There's none righteous, no, not one. What else does God know? There's not a righteous soul upon the whole earth. Uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, not, not only forgive us, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, which is what the young man is saying, we make him, God, a liar, and his word is not in us. Wow, um, what an interesting conversation thus far. So let's go back to Matthew chapter 19 and uh, see what else we can find in this great uh, passage, this record of a conversation between Jesus and this man. In verse 21 of Matthew 19, and, and so Jesus said unto him, we've got this back and forth going on between Jesus and this man, and so <clears throat> Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, and the Greek word, if you'll look at the Greek word, uh, which is rendered perfect <clears throat> in the English, it means saved. What, what he's saying to the young man, if thou wilt be perfect, if thou wilt be saved. Now watch this. He says, go and sell that thou hast and give to the who? <clears throat> the Greek word is to kos. The word poor, as you see it here in this passage in the Greek, is the word tukas. And the definition of the word is those who are destitute of Christ. Normally we would look at the word poor and we would think, not enough money to pay your bills, not enough money to buy food, not enough money to, you know, have a roof over your head, you know, all kinds of mental images that we would connect with the word poor. But Jesus is very precise here, and he, <clears throat> and he says to this young man, Uh, if thou wilt be perfect, or if thou wilt be saved, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, or give to those who do not, give so that those who do not know Jesus Christ can hear about him, know about him, and be saved. Give to the cause of Christ. And what is the cause of Christ? To seek and to save that which is lost. Give to the cause of Christ so that the lost can come to the gospel, uh, salvation. Give to the cause of Christ. And thou shalt have treasure, and, and he goes on to say to the young man, thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. Wow. 
There's so much going on here. It is absolutely amazing. Um, now, what is Jesus doing here? Now, let's read verse 22, and I think that'll help us. Uh, but when the young man heard that saying, did he come to Christ? No. And by the way, if, if you, well, the Bible says he went away. And so if you are walking away from a person, what does that mean you've done? I mean, think about it. If I'm having a conversation with Brother Mark and we're eyeball to eyeball, but now I'm walking away from Brother Mark, it means I've done what? I've turned my back on him. Or, you know, I've, I've turned, I'm walking away from him. And uh, so... Um, what is going on here? I mean, um, not only did he not only did he uh, you know walk away from Jesus, but what was his uh, what was his emotional state? You know, um, he he's not just a young man. He he is a rich he is a rich young man. And so, uh, for notice, and not because I say so, but notice the commentary of Christ in verse 22, for he had, what did he have, church? Great possessions. And the word great, mega, massive, massive uh, amounts of possessions, which, of course, money things mega he was mega rich now I want to ask you a question uh, because thou sh go back to verse 21 if you would please um, thou shalt have treasure in where in heaven Now, let me ask you, I mean, it's so obvious, but sometimes we kind of, we miss it. So, Jesus makes this promise to him, if he will give his mega possessions, his mega wealth, to the cause of Christ, that the lost uh, will be evangelized, uh, He says, you're going to have treasure in heaven. That's what he says. Now, uh, now, what is going on here? Is Jesus teaching this young, rich man that you, you obtain eternal life by purchasing it with your mega wealth? Is that what Jesus is teaching here? No. But, but Jesus is getting to the root of the matter. It, he, he is pinpointing what is going on in the heart of this rich young man. Okay. Um, go back to verse 20, please. He's a rich young man who in his mind has kept all of the commandments Jesus just quoted to him. Despite the fact that he's kept all of the commandments, despite the fact that he's rich, he's young, he's a ruler, he's all of that. Verse 20, the last three words of verse 20, please. You know, the world would look at this rich young ruler who is a man and say, this guy's got it all. He's got the complete package. I mean, 
if I had what he's got, I'd have it made. Isn't it interesting that by the world's standards, he's got the, the complete package and the man with the complete package is coming to Jesus and asking Jesus, what lack I yet? The world would say he's got it all and he's coming to Jesus and, and he's saying to Jesus, I'm lacking something. I'm missing something. And the world can't tell me what it is. I've got all the money that a heart could desire. I've got all of the power. He's a ruler. He's not... He, He's all of that. I, I've got authority. I've got power. I command people. I order people. I'm successful. I'm uh, business oriented. I'm, uh, I've, I've got all of these skill sets. I mean, uh, and uh, I'm young. I've got my youth. But he says there's something. I've got it all, but there's something missing. And it comes to Jesus to find out what it is. And, and Jesus is going to put his thumb or his finger on what is, what is missing. And he does it in a very interesting way. He uh, by the way, if you would, please, uh, I'm just going to speak to believers for just a moment. <clears throat> Those who, uh, who do know Christ as Savior. Uh, Matthew <clears throat> chapter 6, so if you could, you're in Matthew now, I think, so maybe just a few pages earlier. Matthew chapter 6, and, uh, and uh, verse... Uh, 19, because here in Matthew 6 and verse 19, Jesus um, is, uh, is speaking to believers. Um, and look what he says to believers, <clears throat> to men and women who know Christ in verse uh, Matthew 6, verse 19 and uh, yeah, 20. And 21, I guess. So look what Jesus says to uh, <clears throat> his followers, his, you know, disciples. He says, lay not up for yourselves treasures, there's that word again, treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But... Jesus goes on to say to his, his children, his followers, he says, verse 20, but lay up for yourselves. What does Jesus disciple us, teach us to do with our treasures? Child of God. Well, he says, lay up for yourselves treasures where? In heaven. You ever thought about that? Uh, who is the treasure for? Is it for God? Is that kind of the way we think? We, we give to the cause of Christ. We give uh, that missionaries may go. We give that we can uh, obtain Bibles and, and gospel tracts. We give... Uh, you know, uh, to uh, uh, help in the training of, of young men and women uh, for the, uh, the uh, cause of Christ. And, 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 um, but who is the giving for, church, according to Jesus? The giving is for who? Is the giving for God? Now think about this with me. 
Verse 20, let's, let's look at it. But lay up for who? My Bible says yourselves. Treasures in heaven. As somebody said, the only thing that we get to keep eternally is what we gave away here upon the earth in the name of Jesus Christ. Someone else said, in fact, a missionary, I think Jim Elliott to the Alka Indians in Peru said, uh, no man, or for that matter, woman is a fool who gives away that which he or she cannot keep to gain that which they can never lose. And if you're laying it up in heaven, it is for you. The treasure, according to Jesus, is not for him, it's for you. I mean, I'm not making this up. Look at the word of Christ. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven you know uh, where neither moth rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal for where your treasure is there will your heart or your mind heart your mind heart um, there will your heart be also now I want to ask you I want to ask you a question according to the Bible what is the only tangible um, thing that the child of God does in fact have in heaven? What is the only tangible thing that the child of God does in fact have in heaven? And and those, uh, if if we're if we're so blessed to uh, be given a crown or crowns, those we'll cast at the feet of Jesus. The only reason we got the crown is because of Him. He gets the crown back. All glory to God. Uh, what what else? Somebody say something else. What is the only tangible thing you have in heaven? Uh, well, we. Uh, Maybe this will help us out. The Gospel of John, chapter 14, if you would, please. Now, keep your place in Matthew, right? Matthew 19, but the, uh, oh, don't, don't tell anybody. Let them, let them turn there, first thing. You didn't hear Thane, did you? Hope not. Okay. All right. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> well, it's a good answer. Uh, John 14, please, if you would. John 14, John chapter 14. Uh, let not, verse 1, do, you know, it's a, it's a very, it's a very, uh, it's a, a well-known passage. It really is. Uh, it's a much loved passage. Uh, let not your heart be troubled. Uh, ye believe in God. Jesus says, believe also in me. Now, most people will say, I believe in God. But Jesus says, believe also in me. But notice in verse number two, now, these are among the last words Jesus will speak upon earth before he will ascend back to heaven. And he says in verse number two, in my father's house, and what does Jesus tell us are in his father's house? Many mansions. Now he says, if it, if it were not so, I would have told you. He's not going to tell us something that is not so. Whatever he says, he says because it is so. And he says, I go to do what? I go to prepare a place for who? So, the mansion is being prepared for every child of God. 
every man, woman, every young person that does know Jesus Christ as personal Savior is being, is, has a mansion that is being prepared by Jesus Christ. And it's for you, child of God. It's for you. Now, let's go back to Matthew chapter 19 then. Um, of course, um, yes, it's, yes, it's eternal. It's eternal. Those who uh, are recipients of the gift of eternal life have an eternal mansion. Uh, uh, it's your literal, eternal dwelling place. Um, now, you know, getting a dwelling place on earth, that's a pretty big thing, isn't it? If you can, if you can have a dwelling place on earth, you know, we would say a house or uh, some living space, some space in which to live. That's a pretty big deal because if you don't have a space in which to live, then where are you going to live? If you don't have a living space, you know, a roof over, then it's a big deal. It's a pretty big deal. Uh, there, there's a lot being invested into um, a lot of resource, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, labor, a lot of work, a lot of sacrifice, uh, I mean, you name it, to uh, uh, get into a house in, or condominium or an apartment or whatever. Um, this mansion is for you. Um, now, this word, this word um, it, we go back to Matthew 19. Stay with me just for a few more moments. Matthew chapter 19. This word prepare. Uh, well, we just read it. I go to prepare a place for you. Hetoi madzo in the Greek now listen to this. Listen to the definition of this word prepare, uh, the Greek word hetomazo. It means to make ready from that which you laid up in heaven. Who is the treasure for that you're laying up in heaven? Who is the treasure for that you're laying up for? It's for you. And what is the only tangible, I don't know, it doesn't sound right, call it a thing. Um, what does Jesus tell you is yours for all of eternity that he is preparing for you? You see, a lot of people, they really have a hard time with this matter of giving. Whether it be giving of their time, and by the way, giving your time to God counts. There's a, I, there were more people yesterday, four miles up Lake Mead, in the neighborhood Walmart parking lot, giving of their time. And let me tell you, that's precious. That is precious. Uh, everybody's involved in the great struggle of life. And when, you know, you, you give your time, that is precious. You give your time or you give your talents. I, Mary had her drill motor. Did you actually use your drill motor yesterday? I've seen Mary in the past use her drill motor to fasten the fasteners on the fireworks booth sections. It's amazing, you know? Yeah, and what's so great is, uh, my little grandson, how old is Wesson? 
He's nine. He had a drill motor in his hand. He was, he was running. He was fastening the fasteners yesterday. Yeah, doesn't, age doesn't matter. If you know Christ is your Savior and you're giving of your time, that counts. Uh, and, and if you're giving of your talents, that counts. And if you're giving of your resources or your treasure, as Jesus calls it, laying up your treasures in heaven, that counts. And a lot of people have a hard time with giving because they think God is trying to take from them. But here's, here's the big news flash. Say, did you know what you give by way of your time, your talents, your treasures? Did you know God calls that all of that God puts under the umbrella of treasure. And why is it, why does God treasure it? Why does God consider your time, your talents, your resources as treasure? Because that treasure is dedicated to what express purpose here upon the earth that God defines as treasure. What are we giving unto? And why are we giving? What is the object? What is the purpose of our giving? What is it that we are uh, that we are dedicated to accomplish by our giving? Somebody help me out, please. We're after what? What are we after in this world? Amen. I don't know who said that, but thank you. Was it you, Thane? Thank you. Souls souls i assure you god who sacrificed his only begotten son god who watched every life's drop of blood sinless uh, uh, cleansing blood flow from the uh, body of his only begotten son and pool there at the foot of the cross uh, god who placed all of our sins into the body of his son and uh, his son Christ died to pay for our sins. Oh, I assure you, God considers your time, your resources, your talents as treasure because they're dedicated to reaching the lost for Jesus Christ who is worthy. You see, don't make the mistake, and it's a tragic mistake to have a problem with giving to the cause of Christ. It, by the way, and as it concerns giving, what did Jesus say as he sat by the treasury in the house of God watching people come by with their offerings? He saw the mega offerings of the Pharisees. But then he saw an offering of, uh, was she a widow woman? Who gave how much into the treasury? Was it was was it one mite or two mites, which is it constitutes less than a cent? But when Jesus saw the widow, and I I believe the the Bible language is the poor widow cast in two mites. Jesus. The great God of glory looked at her offering and then he looked at the heaping offerings of all the Pharisees and do you remember what Jesus said? Help me out. She gave more. Jesus said about her two mites. She gave more than all of the combined offerings of all of the Pharisees who gave from their abundance. Jesus says she gave more than all of them because she gave from her what? Do you remember the word, the Bible word? Starts with the letter P. It's not poverty. She gave from her penury. Her penury which, yes, is poverty. 
And how much did she give? She gave all that she had. It's God doesn't look at the amount. He looks at, do you know what God looks at? He looks at what was the sacrifice of the giving. Now, I don't feel sorry for the widow. Oh, I don't feel sorry for her at all. If anything, she probably feels sorry for everybody that has an issue with giving to the cause of Christ. <laughs> These 2,000 years later, she's enjoying her mansion. And can you imagine the treasure she laid up in heaven for herself? That then Christ, who is preparing the mansion, used to prepare her mansion? Oh. I, I wonder, is our thinking, are we getting this? Do, do, are, is our thinking right? Or are we cheating ourselves out of the blessings of God? Wow. Um, Matthew chapter 19. It's an amazing passage to me. It really is. Uh, and so, uh, but, but, you know, see, here's, here's a, a rich young ruler who has just been instructed, counseled, commanded by Christ. To, um, to give to the poor, to those who are destitute without Christ, give to the work of God. Uh, to evangelize the world. Statisticians uh, report on the foreign mission field. <laughs> I don't know the world would probably say, shut it down, close it up. But the statisticians who have looked at the amount of missions, offerings given for souls saved on the foreign field, do you know what the average dollar spent per lost soul saved on the foreign field is? One soul saved how much money was invested into reaching that one soul on the foreign mission field. It's different here at home, but on the foreign mission field, the statisticians who research it, they look at what churches were giving to missions, and then they look at the souls that were reported saved. Are you sitting down? Do you know what it cost? to reach one lost soul on the foreign mission field? $10,000. Well, see, that's, that's atrocious. That's, that's, that's awful. That, that's terrible. That's, that's, such a, that's such a poor return for such a large investment. But wait a minute. What did God spend to save your soul? Oh, a lot more than $10,000. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Christ died for our sins, your sins, my sins. Someone said if you were the only soul that needed to be saved, God would have sacrificed his only begotten son just to save you. Wow. Yeah. See, what this young rich ruler is doing is the same thing that so many people still do today. God just told me to give. Thou shalt have treasure in heaven. I guess he didn't listen to that. I, I guess he only heard selective. He has selective hearing. God just told me to give. Uh, but then he promised if I'd give, uh, 
I'd have treasure in heaven. But, but he also said, come follow me. And when the young man, verse 22 to 2 of Matthew 19, heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Uh, Proverbs 11, 4. I mean, what is going on here? What is happening here? Um, he had great possessions. He, mega great. He was mega wealthy. I find this so interesting to me. Uh, Proverbs 11. I hope I said 11.4. Proverbs 11.4. I hope that's what I told you. This, this rich young ruler. I mean, what would life be like? What would life... You know what I heard? I think it was Rick told me. Or somebody told me, somebody told me, somebody told me that uh, in America today, uh, the majority of the population living in America is one flat tire away from complete financial ruin. That, that is how, that is how close to the edge of financial disaster the majority of families are in the United States of America in the economy as it is right now. One, one tire away from being devastated financially. I mean, and they've got the statistics to prove it. It amazes me. Now, Here's a man who can buy anything, he can buy everything he wants. But who does he still come to? Who does he still come to? This man doesn't have to come to anybody. But there's one thing he wants. Say, did you notice there's one thing he wants? That his mega wealth can't purchase him. Do you know what it is? Eternal life. He can buy anything else. But there's one thing he can't buy with his mega wealth. He can't buy eternal life. That's why he's come to Jesus. Look at this. Proverbs is at 11. For riches profit not in the day of wrath or the judgment of God. That's God's wrath. Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness, that's Forgiveness, that's salvation. Righteousness, righteousness delivereth from what? There, there's a couple of things this rich young ruler cannot buy with his money. One is he cannot buy his way into heaven. And number two, he cannot buy his way out of hell. <laughs> wow. And did you notice in verse 22, what was, his, again, what was his emotional condition in verse 22? He, not only did he, he walk away, turn his back and walk away from Jesus, but he walked away in a sorrowful state. Oh, I, I, I thought, I thought, I thought, Happiness was found in money. I thought if you had all the money your heart could desire and you could buy all the things you could, you know, you could possibly want, I thought those were the ingredients for a happy, happy, happy life. Look at his condition. He had great possessions. Um, what, what is God doing with this man? What, what is God? What does God pinpoint as being absolutely necessary in order for this young rich man to have eternal life? 
The fact that he turned his back on Jesus and walked away from Jesus when Jesus told him to give his money to reach the unsaved, the spiritually poor, tells us what about this young man? Tells us what about this young man? And it's very telling, it's very revealing. Where does this young rich ruler where has this rich young ruler placed his trust and his faith? Do you understand what Jesus is working to do with this rich young ruler? Do you understand why Jesus told him to give it? Give it to reach the spiritually poor, the unsaved. Give it. You know what Jesus knows about this young man? He knows his faith and his trust is in his money. Uh, verse 23, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly, that means with extreme difficulty, enter into the kingdom of heaven, and again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Then his disciples, when, it, when his disciples heard it, they were exceeding, uh, exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? This, this whole thing is about salvation. It's about getting saved. Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. That's why we never stop praying for our lost loved ones, our lost friends, because with God all things are possible. Verse 27, stay with me, we're almost done. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Jesus, he says, he says, Behold, we have forsaken all, because Peter and the other disciples watched all of this before their eyes, they just witnessed a rich young ruler turn his back on Jesus Christ and walk away choosing to keep all of his riches and they're being tempted to think again about what they had done. Peter <clears throat> answered and said unto Jesus, Behold, we have forsaken all. Did we make a mistake? Did we, did we do the wrong thing? We, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Look at that. What shall we have therefore? That guy, he went back to his palatial living. He kept his money. He kept his lifestyle. He kept his fortune. He kept his faith. We gave it all away. Did we make a mistake? Ah. Uh. Look at down, drop down to verse 29, and here comes the answer. And everyone that hath forsaken, what? Houses? Or brethren? 
or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, wow, or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit. I mean, see, why would a person forsake all of those things to follow Jesus Christ? What has happened in that person's heart that compels them to follow Christ and to forsake everything mentioned in verse 29? Could it be that person has transferred their trust, their faith from things, from money, over to Jesus Christ? You know, uh, we've got a family case in point that, uh, that have given their lives to Christ. And there, this is just one illustration, no doubt. Um, there are many. They just found out this past Wednesday, they just found out this past Wednesday, along with 90 other families, but I'm thinking about one Christian family who have given their lives to Christ to follow Jesus, to His work, His service. They found out this past Wednesday they're being built a brand new, new house in North Las Vegas. Now, as far as the details, you know, <clears throat> God does what only he can do, and he does it his way, he does it in his timing, but God said to those who, like Peter, have forsaken all, whose Passion, whose love is, is not money, not the things of the world, but Jesus Christ, who are vesting their life in His work, His service, giving their times, their talent, their resources to those who will by faith follow Christ. God says, uh, you'll receive an hundredfold here on earth and eternal life in heaven. We've got a family being built a brand new house. Not only being built a brand new house, but they'll become owners of two houses. <laughs> How amazing is that? How amazing is that? Um, and verse number 30, and we'll close. But many that are first, <clears throat> the word means selfish, shall be last, which is eschatos. In, uh, pro <clears throat> first is protos in the Greek. Last is eschatos in the Greek. Uh, first means <clears throat> um, selfish, uh, Last means lowest in rank. But many that are first now, and they won't consider Christ because they don't want Christ to be first, they want to be first, uh, shall be last. <clears throat> they will be the lowest in rank. And the last, those who are considered by the world to be the last now because they have followed Christ, they shall be first. Uh, the word means highest in rank. We better get this right, folks. Uh, those who have traded the world for Jesus will be considered highest. Those who are turning their back on Jesus for the world will be considered the lowest. Oh, 
Father, when we give, we're giving to ourself. Um, we lay up treasures for ourselves in heaven when we give. And, and the only tangible thing that is ours personally in heaven is a promised mansion that you prepare somehow, some way, using the treasures that we have sent on ahead of our arrival. Huh. And, and it's not the amount, it, it's... It's the sacrifice that the giving resulted in in our lives. For the widow, woman, two mites, that was a greater sacrifice for her than the heaping riches of all the Pharisees. Who gave from their abundance, uh, she gave all that she had. And, and it'll be exciting to meet her and, uh, and to see what you have done for her, God. Lord, bless your word. I, I, my prayer is you'll find all of us trusting in Jesus Christ for the salvation of our souls. I, I, uh, but the reality is if you find any of us trusting in money, trusting in success, trusting in power, uh, I pray that you'd bring us to Jesus in faith, trusting only in him for our eternal life. Father, save souls. And if you find us struggling in this matter of giving to the cause of Christ, that the spiritually poor may know him, God, remind us that as we give, we're laying treasure up in heaven for ourselves. God, help us to get our thinking uh, in line with your word. In Jesus' name we pray.